would like to introduce to you Father Mikhailo Planchak, who will be our presenter for tonight. Father Planchak completed his theology studies in Zagreb in, in Croatia in 1979. And 1979 was a busy year for him because in January of that year, he married the love of his life, Helena, and in July was ordained to the priesthood of that same year. For 10 years, he served as pastor in Devetina, Bosnia, and then in 1989 with Helena and their four children, Father Planchak moved to the Edmonton Eparchy. Father Planchak has served at various parishes throughout the eparchy and is currently pastor at Holy Eucharist, Par Holy Eucharist Parish in Edmonton. He's an experienced speaker and a presenter, and we are very excited to hear him talk to us tonight. Father Planchak's children are grown with families of their own now, and so he and Helena are proud grandparents to seven beautiful grandchildren, and they are currently awaiting the arrival of number eight. Slava Isusu Christu. Glory be to Jesus Christ. Glory be to the anointed one, as Father Stephen would say. Because we are um, celebrating uh, Annunciation, Blahovishchenya, uh, let us pray then. Uh, I picked a, a short uh, hymn from uh, Molebin. Vojimja Otsja i Sina i Svetoho Duha, Amin, na nimu do Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Vojimja Otsja i Sina i Svetoho Duha, Amin. Gracious Lady, you pray for all those who with faith take refuge in your powerful protection. We sinners, ever in uh, misery and affliction, have no other uh, recourse to God than you. We are uh, burdened by many sins, O oh, Mother of God. We bow down before you, save your servants, from every calamity. Presvetaya Bohorodice, Spasenas, O Most Holy Mother of God, save us. Vojimja Otsja i Sina i Svetohu Duha, Amin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Vojimja Otsja i Sina i Svetohu Duha, Amin. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ stands alone as the most important event humankind has ever known. The Bible tells us that long before the world began, God had planned that the crucifixion of, our, of Jesus would be the method and payment for our sins. And we can see that in uh, First Peter uh, uh, letter, Peter's letter, uh, one uh, chapter one uh, verses nineteen to twenty. But with the uh, precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or uh, defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times. Of for uh, your sake. Some prophecies mention Jesus Christ and some don't. Father Danilo could explain that so well in prophecies that are direct and prophecies that are uh, indirect. Some uh, teachers and Bible scholars say that there are about 350 prophecies fulfilled in, uh, by Jesus Christ in the New Testament. I'm going to share it with you tonight only several concerning the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our catechism, uh, uh, our catechism Christ, our Pascha, uh, talks about the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, in the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah gives witness to the suffering of a servant of God, which the church 
recognize uh, to be the suffering of Christ. That's Isaiah 53 chapter. And by the way, I uh, recommend that everyone, especially during this Lent, should read the chapter 53 of Isaiah and, uh, um, and uh, f see by yourself how vividly, how uh, nicely Isaiah expressed and explained. These prophecies of Isaiah concerning our Lord is one of the most remarkable in all of all the Old Testament scriptures. Isaiah, standing many centuries in advance of these events, describes them as if he had been an eyewitness. There is no possible way to account for this uh, except that Isaiah was divinely inspired as he claimed to be. I will not read at this point uh, uh, the Isaiah's chapter 53 because we will be coming to it over and over through, through, my, uh, uh, um, through my presentation. How can we be sure that these prophecies uh, actually apply to Jesus Christ? Well, I guess uh, all of us, uh, I know Father Danello referred to Luke 24, 13, 23. Uh, Father Stephen also did. So I, I am doing that the same, where uh, uh, um, Jesus Christ appeared to the two apostles uh, who were going to Emmaus, and Jesus appeared to them and talked to them. First, they did not recognize him, and he said, you fools, how don't you understand that, that everything that is uh, in the Bible is about me? So let us start with the first prophecy that I would like to share with you, a prophecy from the Old Testament and then, uh, um, um, then comparing it with uh, fulfillment uh, in the New Testament. The Messiah will be rejected by his own people. We go to Isaiah 53, uh, verse 3. Chapters uh, 40 to 55 in the book of Isaiah address the people of Israel in exile in Babylon directly before the time of their return, and that's approximately about 538. So Isaiah said, He was spurned and avoided by man, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom uh, men hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. And these words were fulfilled, uh, we can find uh, in uh, St. John uh, chapter 1 and verses 10 to 11, where uh, uh, St. John said, he was in the world, and the world came to be through him, but the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, but his own people did not accept him. We uh, in church read these words, I believe everybody um, would know that, uh, uh, on Easter Sunday, uh, Divine Liturgy. And then the second quote uh, from St. Saint, uh, Saint Matthew, uh, chapter 26, uh, and uh, uh, verses 3 and 4. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the place of the high priest, who was called uh, Caiaphas, and they consulted together to arrest Jesus by treachery, and put him to death. And I guess everybody understands that these words are always, we read always on Good Friday. So the next uh, prophecy that I would like to share with you is the Messiah will be betrayed by one of his uh, followers. 
if we go to the psalm, Psalm 50, 55, uh, the Psalm 55 outlines the betrayal of the trusted friend who was follower of God. And the Psalm says, for Psalm 55, 12, 13, if an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were uh, rising against me, I could hide. But it is you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend. And these words uh, were fulfilled uh, in the New Testament by Jesus Christ and St. Matthew recorded them in chapter 26, uh, verse 47 and 49 and 50. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived accompanied by the large crowd with swords and clubs who had come from the chief priest and the elder of the, of the, of the people Immediately, he went over to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus answered him, Friend, do what you have come for. Then, uh, stepping, stepping forward, they laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. The next prophecy is the Messiah will be betrayed uh, for 30 pieces of silver. This time we go to Zechariah. In chapter 11 of the book of the Zechariah, the prophet uh, refers to 30 shackles of silver as a goodly price. This amount also refers to the amount paid for the life of a slave. Zechariah's prophecy speaks about the amount paid for the Lord and his life. So Zechariah 11 uh, chapter and verses 12 and 13. I told them, if you think it best, give me the pay, my pay, but if not, keep it. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter. The handsome price at which they would uh, value me. So I look at 30 pieces of silver and throw them in the potter at the house of the Lord. You remember that for those 30 pieces of silver... The, 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 the priests bought uh, potter's field for burial of the strangers. And the potter's field was nothing else but was a junk field for the uh, people of Jerusalem at that time. So these this words were fulfilled by Jesus Christ and St. Matthew recorded them in uh, chapter 26 verses 14 to 16, and chapter 27, uh, three, verses 3 to 4. The one of the twelve, who was called uh, Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? They paid him 30 pieces of silver, and from that time on, he looked for an opportunity to hand him over. And then the next quote, Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that the Jesus had been condemned, deeply regretted what he had done. He returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in betraying innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? Look at yourself. So Jesus was sold practically 
for 30 pieces of silver as a slave. The next uh, prophecy that I would like to share with you is uh, the Messiah will be tried and condemned. We go back to Isaiah chapter 53, verse 8, where Isaiah said, Seized and condemned, he was taken away. Who would have thought any more of his uh, destiny? For he was cut off from the land of the living, struck for the sins of the people. And these words were fulfilled again uh, uh, by, Saint, uh, by Jesus Christ uh, and recorded by St. Matthew in chapter 27, verses 1 and 2. When it was morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took uh, counsel against Jesus to put him to death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. And Luke 23, chapter and verse 1. Then the whole assembly of them arose and brought him before Pilate. The next uh, prophecy is the Messiah will be silent before his uh, accusers. We go this time to Psalm 35 and verse uh, 11. Malicious witnesses rise up, accuse me of things I do not know. And then uh, Isaiah 53, verse 7. Though harshly treated, he submitted and did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to slaughter, or a sheep silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. And these words were fulfilled by Jesus, recorded by St. Matthew and Mark and Peter, and St. Matthew uh, chapter 27, 12, uh, 14. And when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he made no answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they are testifying against you? But he did not answer him one word, so that the governor was greatly amazed. And Mark 15, three, verse 3 and 5, the chief priests accused him of many things. Again, Pilate uh, questioned him. Have you no answer? See how many things they accuse you of. Jesus gave him no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. And then the first letter of St. Peter, chapter 2 and verses 22 and 23. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was insulted, he returned no insult. When he suffered, he did not threaten. Instead, he handed himself over to the one who judges justly. And the next, proph next prophecy is the Messiah will be struck. We go back to Isaiah. But this time, Isaiah 50 and verse 6. I give my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who tore at my beard. My face I did not hide from in insults and spitting. And Matthew 26 and verses 67 and 68 and 27 and 30. Then they spat in his face and struck him, while, ha, while some uh, 
slapped him saying, prophesize for us, Messiah, who is it that struck you? They spat upon him and took a reed and kept striking him on the head. And Mark 14 and verse 64. Some began to spit on him. They blindfolded him and struck him and said to him, Prophesy. And the guards greeted him with the bows. Sorry, blows. And Mark 15, uh, verse 19, and kept striking his head with a reed and spitting upon him, they kneeled before him in honor. And John 19, 1, 3, then Pilate took Jesus and had him uh, uh, accused, uh, uh, scourged, and he uh, and the, the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and uh, um, clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him repeatedly. The next prophecy is the Messiah will be mocked. And again, again we go to Psalm 22 and uh, verses 7 and 8. But I am a worm, not a man, Scor scorned by man, despised by the people. All who see me mock me, they curl their uh, lips and jeer. They shake their heads at me. And in Matthew, where these words are recorded and fulfilled by Jesus in Matthew 27 and verses 39 and 40, those passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads and saying, you who destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you are the son of God. Come down from the cross. The eighth um, prophecy that I would like to share with you is the Messiah to die by crucifixion with pierced uh, hands and feet. At this time we go to Zechariah. In chapter 12 of the book of Zechariah, the prophet speaks of God's own uh, representative who is killed at the hands of his people. At the future point, the people of God will uh, realize whom they have pierced and will mourn for the son who died. So Zechariah in uh, chapter 12 and verse 10, he said, Then I will pour out on the house of David and of the people of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and prayer, and they will look on me the one whom they pierced, they will mourn for him as, for, uh, as one mourns an only child and weep bitterly for him as one grieves a firstborn son. And these words were fulfilled by Jesus and recorded by Matthew uh, chapter 27, 31, uh, and when they had mocked him, they stripped him off his cloak, dressed him in his own clothes, and led him off to crucify him. And Mark 15, verse 20. And when they mocked him, they stripped him off the pu uh, purple cloak, 
dressed him in his own clothes, and led him to out to be crucified. The Messiah garments will be divided by uh, casting lots. We go to Psalm 22, uh, verse 18. I can count all my bones. They stare at me and uh, gloat. They divided my garments among them. For my clothing, they cast lots. And Matthew 27, 35. After they had crucified him, they divided his garments by casting lots. And Mark, almost the same uh, sentence, where Mark said in chapter 15, verse 24, Then they crucified him and divided his garments by casting lots for, to see what each should take. And the last one that I would like to share with you today, uh, prophecy, is the Messiah will be buried in a rich man's tomb. Once again, the great prophecy of a prophet Isaiah in the um, suffering servant reveals the incredible uh, purpose of God in sending the Messiah to suffer for our sins. Isaiah foretold that the Messiah would die and be buried in a rich man's grave. Isaiah uh, 53 chapter and verse 9. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. And this is fulfilled uh, by Jesus. We know that so well. And um, it's uh, recorded by St. Matthew in uh, chapter 27 and verses 57 and to 60. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea, named Joseph, who's, uh, who was uh, himself a, di a disciple of, Judas, of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be handed over. Taking the body, Joseph wrapped it in clean linen and laid it in his uh, uh, new tomb that he had given in the rock. Then he rolled a huge stone across, across the entrance to the tomb and departed. So, my dear friends, God who, who can uh, control all events caused these prophecies to be written hundreds of years before they were fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth, as it was proclaimed in the Acts uh, um, chapter 3 and verse 18. In this way, God fulfilled what he had uh, foretold through all the prophets that his Messiah would uh, suffer. To accurately foretell events 200 or uh, to 800 years before Jesus Christ is in advance is nothing less than a miracle, one that required the divine knowledge and power to bring them to pass as foretold. God doesn't do things by chance. He knew even from the foundation of the world, that his son would have to come to earth, and uh, he foretold the events of his birth, of his death, and his resurrection. So we would have firm evidence on which to base 
our belief. So, my dear friends, Jesus suffered. Jesus suffered for us. But what about our personal suffering? Two questions have worried the minds of Christians and non-Christians alike. Why does God allow suffering? God who is so good, God who is so loving, who is our Heavenly Father, why does He allow suffering? But before we look at the problem of suffering, we should address the notion of happiness. Our uh, definition of happiness today is much different than traditional one. It is based on feelings. Traditional definition of suffering uh, is uh, tra traditional uh, definition of uh, happiness is to have a good spirit, to have a good life, to live well, to love well. But uh, modern definition is based only on feelings. Not feeling good, but loving well. Feeling good is not compatible with suffering, while, while living good life is compatible with suffering. Love well, have a good life, is compatible with suffering. And uh, the wonderful, the best example for all of us is uh, the loving marriage relationship. The husband and wife, they sacrifice their self, themselves for the children. It is not easy to give a birth. We should ask all mothers and uh, they would tell us. But it's not easy also to raise children. How many sleepless nights mothers and fathers why? Because of love. Many of us actually set ourselves up for uh, not being happy as we accept modern definition of happiness, feeling good. Oh, I like it. It's so good. I feel good. This steak is so tasty or this pie is so good. So, what is happiness? The fathers of the church, the saints, the church is teaching us. The answer is so very simple. The only way that we will be happy is to surrender our will to God, to accept God's will. So, to find happiness and meaning in life, we are supposed to accept the will of our Heavenly Father and to see the meaning and higher good in every step of our life, in every suffering. Nothing in life has meaning unless we attach meaning to it. If we can attach meaning to our suffering, if there is some value in what we are experiencing, we can endure everything and anything. Meaning of human suffering, we can understand only in the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the reason why I'm connecting these two, two uh, subjects. On the cross, Jesus not only embraced human suffering, but he also made suffering redemptive. Remember this word, redemptive. He conquered evil with good. Christ gives us the answer to the question about suffering and uh, give its meaning. In the great... Uh, Apostle, apostolic letter of St. John Paul II on the Christian meaning of human suffering, 
he wrote, and we know so well how he was so familiar with suffering. He suffered so much. He said, human suffering has reached its culmination in the passion of Jesus Christ. And at the same time, it has in entered into a completely new dimension and uh, a new order. It has been link linked to love, to that love which uh, creates good. So the key word in this is love. So St. Paul writes about sharing in the, in the uh, sufferings of Jesus Christ. In Colossians 1, uh, 24, he said this, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I complete what is lacking in Christ's uh, um, afflictions, for the sake of his body, that is the church. What? Something is lacking in Jesus' suffering, St. Paul said? What might, might, we might ask our, uh, ourselves the question, what can possibly be lacking in Christ's suffering? Jesus completed everything. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. And yes, it is finished. But we, as the body, as a mystical body of our Lord Jesus Christ, are contributing to it by being finished. So we are bringing our share. What can possibly be lacking in Christ's suffering? The answer is that all that is lacking is my share your share, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. To understand that better, let us think that in eternity is always now. There is no yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So, Jesus' birth, Jesus' uh, uh, suffering, Jesus' resurrection is constantly uh, present. And our suffering is part of that. As St. Paul, John Paul II, he wrote, the redemption achieved by Christ remains always open to all love experienced in human, su in human suffering. In the dimensions of love, the redemption is in a... Uh, certain sense constantly being accomplished. So redemption is a process, is constantly being accomplished. And remember the key word, love. Jesus Christ achieved the redemption completely and to the very limits, but at the same time, he did not bring it to a close. Our suffering can become part of Christ's work, the greatest work ever done, the work of salvation. So, each one of us, accepting that suffering, whatever that would be, we bring that our little share and salvation is then achieved and accomplished. So, this happiness, when we have faith, this happens, sorry, when we have faith, with faith we offer our sufferings up to God, and he uses them in a mysterious and powerful way for the redemption of the world through the power of love, the love that is the very inner life of God. So remember, the key word is love. 
At this point, I uh, would like to share a story with you, a personal story. Uh, when I was pastor just uh, in this neighborhood, and um, uh, the next uh, door is a senior, uh, senior's home, uh, and there was a lady uh, who suffered, that was many years ago, uh, she suffered greatly, and she was sick, and uh, I visited her periodically, and uh, she um, told me how she is praying and offering uh, all her suffering for her grandson who was far away from God. And for many years she was doing that, and she passed away, but she didn't see conversion of her great gr grandson. So one day, as I was in the office, a young man came to my office and uh, approached me and said, Father, do you remember such and such a lady uh, in the senior, senior's home? Yeah, I do remember. Father, you know, I'm aware, and she told me that, that she prayed for me for my conversion and uh, that she offered even her sacrifice, her pains and itches and so on for uh, my conversion. But uh, I never paid much attention to that. Father, is uh, several years already since she passed away and uh, something is bothering me. Please, can you help me to come closer to God? She did not see him on the earth to be converted, but I believe from heaven she was smiling. In the book on suffering, When You Suffer by Jeff Kevins, and I am using mostly from this book uh, his thoughts and ideas, um, he calls this kind of offering up to God, he said that's a heavenly cash. We know uh, in last uh, several weeks, uh, what happened with our uh, earthly cash in our banks. <laughs> but uh, this kind of uh, heavenly cash can't be compared with uh, earthly cash. This cash will never, heavenly cash will never lose value. It's always important. As this grandma prayed for her grandson, my dear friends, offer up any kind of suffering that you have for your children, for your grandchildren, for your great-grandchildren, for our parishes, for our communities. You may not see change, but remember heavenly cash will never cease to exist. We are joined to Jesus Christ as the body is uh, to the head. We are united with him in our physical and moral suffering. Our sufferings become one with his. In other words, our suffering takes on meaning due to the mystical union that exists between the head and the body. Our suffering offered to God in faith and love receives a redemptive character. When we offer, offer up to God our even the smallest sacrifice, it receives, becomes the redemptive. In the light of the gospel, we see that our suffering is actually a gift, a gift of the some sort of uh, this present life. It is the gift of an opportunity to give ourselves uh, entirely to God, to surrender ourselves to our Heavenly Father. And uh, as the uh, end of this presentation, I would like to share one of my real personal stories. 
It happened in uh, uh, 1972 in former Yugoslavia. I was uh, in my 20s, and uh, as such, a seminarian and uh, every, every healthy man did not have a choice but have to serve army, communist army. So it was my turn. They knew that I am seminarian. I didn't know at the beginning, but later on I learned that there were few uh, soldiers and few other officers who were assigned to follow me and to check on me in every step what I am doing, what I am talking to soldiers, and so on and on. For the first six months, we were in our uh, uh, base having exercises, practices, training, and so on. And then for the rest, uh, almost a year, we were assigned to work in the construction, military construction, far away in the wilderness, far from civilization. So they set up some uh, big tents for us, and there were whole, whole, uh, several hundred uh, soldiers at that place. And somehow, somehow, I don't know how, I was, I don't know if I can say lucky, but I was assigned to an easy job. I was working actually with engineers. Um, three of us or four of us soldiers were working with engineers, measuring, uh, you know, putting those markers and so on for that construction uh, place. But the rest of my unit was assigned to work in the, um, in the um, mine where they were breaking uh, stone and crushing stone. Uh, big rocks, so they would uh, break big uh, with dynamite, you know, and then they would be big like this or smaller or even bigger. And uh, we would uh, get a uh, 20 pounds hammer, 20 pounds hammers, hammer, and all day break those stones, bang, 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 you know. So as I said, I, I, I did not do it, but it happened somehow that somebody was jealous of three of us or four of us, and they reported something, accused of, of us of something, and we got punished. And I got punished with other soldiers to go to that, uh, to that uh, mine to break those stones with 20 pounds big hammer. And I am a not very strong guy, you know, and uh, so after a couple of days working there, my, uh, my hands were all bloody and my muscles were all inflamed and uh, uh, it was so warm, uh, you know, almost plus 40s. And, uh, and I didn't know how to do that. You know, everything you do, you need to know something about it. I never have done that. So I was hitting those rocks and hitting and hitting and couldn't succeed anything. So one soldier approached me and he said, look at you look at this big uh, stone. You, you look at these veins. You have to hit here in this vein, and then we'll split. Hmm, okay. So I lifted up that huge hammer, and I hit that rock. And it, yes, exactly, it split in two parts. But as that rock split in two parts, I saw on one side something like a little pocket in that rock. And there was something shining, something shining. I came closer and I noticed, I noticed this. I noticed this, a crystallized cross. My spine was frozen, even was plus 40. And I was all scared and said, Lord, what is this? And then I heard a voice. I heard a voice from outside that said, pick up your cross and follow me. Pick up your cross and follow me. Don't complain. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus suffered for all of us. 
and we have uh, some little sufferings, especially at this time, as we all experience this tremendous fear, fear of this pandemic. And yes, there is a fear of death, where thousands of people are dying around us, and we don't know what will happen tomorrow. Let us, it's good opportunity that we stop, pause, and pay more attention to our contact with our Heavenly Father. Let us all pick up our crosses, offer them up to our Heavenly Father, make them to become heavenly cash, and make something good of them. O Lord, Jesus Christ, Son of God, at this time of a great tribulation in the world and the fear, we ask you, Lord, protect each one of us. We especially pray for the people who are dying, for the people who are sick from this illness, for the people who are all around us in fear. We especially pray, Lord, for those who are on the front line, those nurses, doctors, all those who are helping sick people. We remember those 90 priests and the bishop who recently died from this illness. O oh Lord, Jesus Christ, Son of God, bless them. And bless each one of us, strengthen our faith, multiply our faith, that we can be strong, that we can understand that our faith be multiplied, that we be always your faithful children, no matter what, illness, sickness, that we can understand happiness, even in the midst of this fear that we can find moments of happiness. Lord, we are so thankful to you that even by uh, streaming live uh, liturgies that we can participate and, and take part in them at home. Yes, we are deprived of Holy Communion, but we receive spiritual communion. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, forgive us our sins and grant us your blessing. O Mother of God, pray for our sinners. Amen. Slava Jesus Christ.